All right, there we go. Hi everyone, how's it going? Tim here, and this is BXGS Weekly, a JavaScript news podcast that comes out every Friday where we have a look at this week's news and uh, discuss them, I guess. I mean, not much discussion from um, your side, I guess, but uh, you know what, what I mean. All right, so I've already prepared the episode two markdown file here in the repository in case you wanna follow along. So it's already filled uh, with everything, with links and stuff and, you know, nicely formatted. So if you are interested or if you are watching this post factum on YouTube and want to see the links, you can find them in the repository. Let's get started. So our first news of the day is the new TC39 proposal called Object from Entries, um, which is kind of really obvious one. So if you um, if you know there is an object.entries, uh, function that returns the entries for the object, right? Uh, and object from entries essentially reverses that. So you can convert the entries of the object into the object again, right? So it's very straightforward, nothing fancy here. I'm uh, expecting this to be accepted very quickly. It does make a lot of sense. Um, I would even say it's kind of weird that it wasn't there in the first place. Um, not sure what my cats are doing behind me, but if you hear weird sounds, it's my cats, not me. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so there you go. This is, um, yeah, new proposal. I think it's stage zero right now. Um, it doesn't even say here. Yeah, it looks like maybe it's not even staged yet. So it's just, yeah, it's just, wait a second. Ah. All right, um, there we go. Cats are calm down. <laughs> Let us continue. So the next thing is the article called Creating Suspense in React 16.2. If you watched my um, BXGS Weekly last week, right, I talked about the video that talked about the future of uh, React. And one of the things was this um, sort of automatic fetching and automatic loading display, basically autom automatic resolving of the promises, right? This is what uh, the React team calls suspense. And this is basically more in-depth article that goes into how exactly that works. How do you actually handle all of that? And you know, uh, how do you use it? And what's, why do you need it in the React core? It's, it's a very interesting read through. So if you're interested in the details and if you're interested in the React ecosystem, I highly recommend reading through that. It's a very good article. Right, continuing. So um, next one is automatically creating an accessible color palette from any color, sure. Uh, as you might guess from the name, it's an article about the generation of the accessible color palettes. If you never work with accessibility, then uh, this is, I mean, it's a good place to start, I guess. The idea is that there's basically a lot of people who perceive colors differently, right? And uh, just creating some color palettes usually doesn't work for them because they cannot really distinguish them uh, as much as the uh, every other person, right? So you have to be very careful with the color palettes. And this article goes in depth into talking about how you uh, generate this uh, right, the color palettes that would fit for everyone programmatically, right? So this is actually pretty cool. And there's some interesting uh, mathematics in the background, basically. Here's an example of the generated palettes and uh, it's, it's actually a very interesting read through. So if you are into accessibility, that will be very interesting for you right away. If you are not into accessibility, well, that's a good place to start. So you can start with, you know, learning the color schemes. That's always great. And uh, yeah, that's about it. The next one, this is actually a very big write up. Uh, it's named JavaScript versus backward compatibility. So if you remember, if you watched the previous uh, BXGS weekly, we discussed the fact that the uh, array flat map and array flatten cannot be used because of the MooJS tools that have the same methods with different signatures and you know, using the same names would break the web, right? And this is something TC39 never does. And this is the article that actually goes on a pretty lengthy discussion about, you know, what is okay to do and what is not okay to do from the language um, specification perspective, right? It's a very interesting read through and there's a lot of quotes from the comments on that thread in GitHub, a lot of sort of meta discussion and thoughts of like a very experienced developer. So it's a very interesting read through, so I won't go through it right now because it's you know kind of meta topic and i don't think it's um 
yeah, it's it's basically, we have time for that. So I wanna keep, as you can see this week around, we have a lot of stuff to discuss. So I'm gonna just pass through that. But I would highly suggest that every one of you who are interested in JavaScript, read that to know um, basically what, what kind of reasoning people have about this kind of topic, right? Because it's very, very interesting to read different perspectives as usual. So let us continue. Oh yeah, this is the, not exactly the news, but um, kind of news, I guess. It's a developer server results from Stack Overflow for the 2018. Um, um, you might have participated in this, might be not, but there is quite a lot of people who did. And there are some interesting numbers. Um, take them with a grain of salt because this is essentially the demography that visits Stack Overflow. So there are obviously, this is, differs wildly from the complete developer um, population, I guess, let's put it this way. But it's still quite interesting to see some things like, you know, for example, there is uh, almost 50% of the full stack developers on Stack Overflow, which is kind of crazy. I never would imagine this number, for example. And um, the cool thing is that, yeah, almost a half of people contribute to open source, which is also amazing. Like this is the number I also did not expect actually. Uh, and this is like, this stuff blows my mind. So almost 80%, even more than 80% do the coding as a hobby, which is, you know, I obviously do that, but I know there's the, not as many people who do that in their free time, at least in my circles, because they usually don't have that free time. But uh, it's actually really cool to know that there are more than 80% of developers on Stack Overflow who actually do that. So it's it's kind of amazing. Um, yeah, there's also stuff like experience, coding years professionally, um, education, all of that is kind of boring-ish. And yeah, it's exactly what you would expect it to be, I guess. Um, the ways to develop on their own. Yeah, I, I don't think there's anything interesting here. It's like yeah, official docs, Stack Overflow, obviously. Like, to, Let's ask about the, if you use questions on Stack Overflow, on Stack Overflow, that sounds like a reasonable way to measure it. And um, I'm curious who the 20% who answered, they don't actually do that. How did they end up taking that survey? <laughs> That's a very interesting one, I think. So um, yeah, there's the hackathons, boot camps. Yeah, as, as I've said, you know, the some stats are not exactly representative. It's like, this is basically what you get on the Stack Overflow, not exactly the global population of developers. So it's a bit skewed, but yeah, it's uh, interesting nonetheless. So there's, I guess more or less, there's like technology, there's the interesting bit. So JavaScript is as usual, is like on one of the top spots. Um, Rust and Kotlin are actually one of the most wanted languages, most loved languages. And I can absolutely agree with Kotlin. So this is, this I've used it, Basically, whenever I need to write something for JVM or to have interop with Java when I'm not forced to do Java, I go with Kotlin because I find it to be a pretty cool language. Uh, Rust, I've only played around a bit with. It looks interesting, definitely better than C, but still very low level and I don't really, you know, I'm not, not a person who likes uh, as low level languages, essentially. Threaded languages, someone still writes Visual Basic 6. I really sorry for those people. Um, same goes for Cobble, I guess this is your legacy systems that are terrifyingly old and nobody wants to touch them. But yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting. Interesting that people dread assembly. I mean, I wouldn't say there's nice language to write, but it's pretty straightforward. It's like, it might be hard to reason about. I wouldn't say I dreaded that, but uh, hey, you know, everyone has their own kinks. So wanted, uh, Python and JavaScript on the top, I'm guessing Python because machine learning, JavaScript because well, Node.js and all that stuff kind of on the rise and uh, Golang as well, Kotlin as well, which is, those, those are really cool to see. Development tools and IDE, as you would expect, Visual Studio Code right here, always really cool to see. Visual Studio surprisingly high here, I'm guessing because of all the Windows development going on around. Um, the, picture doesn't really change across the all respondents and web developers. I'm guessing because most of the uh, Stack Overflow users are web developers. Uh, mobile development obviously changes that quite a bit because Android Studio is one of the top tools uh, with Visual Studio Code surprisingly following the suit, not Xcode. So I would expect to see the Xcode here, which, you know, kind of iOS is a big um, environment, big uh, system, right? So 
We would expect to see the Xcode git, but it, it's actually, you know, I never liked using Xcode. It's clunky, it crashes all the time. So I would prefer using VS Code as well here, but I guess that shows. DevOps, uh, those are the crazy people who like Wim, basically. Uh, you can just leave that category over here. Top pain technologies. Um, all right, this is F sharp. So if you're a crazy functional programming person, you're going to get paid pretty well, basically. <laughs> That's all you have to learn from that. Uh, Groovy, surprisingly, um, Perl is still around. I'm not sure how actually the numbers, because they released the Perl 6 recently, right? I'm not sure what the numbers of the real like version usage in the wild. I'm guessing everyone's still on like Perl 5 probably. Rust is actually one of the highest paid. I mean, Erlang obviously and uh, Scala. This is probably data science related. Golang, low level backend stuff. Ruby still pays quite well. I mean, I, I, I personally like Ruby. It's a really nice language and I... Uh, wrote my thesis, for example, using Ruby. So it was like a remote learning system uh, with a bunch of clients and uh, we used Ruby for that. It was very easy to develop actually with uh, almost as easy as the Python and uh, I guess modern JavaScript, let's put it this way. Um, yeah, so what else do we have? Correlations, boring technology in society that is boring. You can have a look at that yourself. Oh yeah, you know what? That's a cool question. So um, let us see. I'm very curious about the, uh, uh, wait, oh, I forgot to disable notifications. Give me a second. There you go. I'm very curious to see what the remote uh, market looks like. We Do we have a remote here, development practices? Uh, no, they don't really seem to have the remote. Wait a second. Let me see. Remote. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so this is the Potential. Okay, so only 10% of people assess uh, working remotely. I would say this is like one of the highest priority things for me. Like benefits, compensation, all of that stuff. Is that the only thing that they, there's like, I guess, yeah, I guess you cannot really, but they could have asked people if they are already working remotely, but I guess those 10% probably are. <laughs> so there you go. Um, we got community, which is boring, and then methodology description, which is quite nice. Most of the respondents are actually from Europe, which is surprising considering, you know, the Stagger Falls kind of North American thing, but uh, there you go. So again, the link is in the document. So if you wish to look at the more stats, go ahead and uh, kick yourself out. There's plenty of interesting insights to get here. Let us continue. The next thing, this is the article that is very interesting actually, right? Because it's a very unexpected bug. So it's called Gone, gone in a Thousand and Hundred Seconds. Weirdest bug I have ever met. And that is not a lie because I've never met any bugs that are weirder than that. Probably I may be forgetting something, but basically what they encountered are they have the WebRTC platform uh, that when used with Edge as one of the clients, uh, by Edge, I mean Microsoft Edge, the browser, it dropped the calls after 18 minutes and 20 seconds exactly. And um, it's, it's a very interesting insight into how WebRTC works, how the IC connections work and all that kind of stuff. So if you are interested in that kind of stuff, and even maybe even if not, it's really cool to read how they basically tracked it down and how they fixed it, because it's a, it's a very unique bug. Because if you do the same with Chrome to Chrome or Firefox to Edge, it works um, fine, right? So uh, I think, wait, Chrome, Chrome to Chrome worked fine. I think Firefox to Edge failed. And then Chrome to Edge worked fine as well. So it only failed Edge to Chrome or Firefox to Edge, for example. Some very, very weird stuff. Um, really cool to read about. I love articles like this. So yeah, highly recommend it. As, this, as you can see, the IC transport policy is the kind of culprit here, I guess, or the solution uh, if you look at it from different uh, perspective. And the logs are what help them track the thing down because, you know, late waiting for 18 minutes, 20 seconds to track down the bug is quite time expensive. All right, continuing. Understanding the V8's bytecode. Um, this is, as you might imagine, is an article that goes pretty in depth on how the V8 bytecode is uh, working essentially, right? How is it generated? How is it executed? How does it look? And um, one, if you don't know this, I would highly recommend reading that. If you know this already, but kind of forgot this, this is a very good refresher. So it's not a very long article. It's pretty brief, but it does shows, you know, how the function compiles to V8 bytecode. How can you inspect that using Node.js, for example, using the print bytecode flag, uh, which is, you know, pretty straightforward. 
uh, and some additional minor things that basically explain the execution. So the command by command, what they do and so on and so forth. So it's a really cool a little article that can give you a lot of insight into the actual call execution within the V8 engine. Uh, bear in mind that this is a V8 specific, so it might be different from say Firefox or Edge, right? So I think they do work slightly differently. Okay, continuing, you might not need the virtual DOM. Um, exactly as the article says, it goes on to talk about the uh, basically new library that the author developed. It's called Pure Script as DOM. So as DOM stands for the static DOM. And the idea is that you don't really always need virtual DOM and virtual DOM brings in a huge overhead, right? And there is a pretty convincing explanation here of, you know, why you might not need virtual DOM, why you can be, uh, why the static DOM might be sufficient for you and also how to implement that. So there's a lot of uh, kind of theoretical basis here and it's more of a theory article, but it, it does back the actual existing library, which you can go ahead and uh, have a look at the source code if you're interested. Uh, it is in a pure script, so it's not a JavaScript library, but I think pure script is relatively simple, right? So it's it's not exactly JavaScript, but it's not too hard to read. I guess you would have to um, get familiar with the syntax a bit, but it, you know, it doesn't look completely alien, basically. It shouldn't look completely alien to JavaScript developers. So it is an interesting bit of tech. And uh, if you are interested in all this, you know, React underlinings, I would recommend looking into that. That's a good one. Right, next one is um, Cloudflare announcement. Yeah, let me try that again, Cloudflare announcement. So they launched the um, service that allows you to run JavaScript workers on Cloudflare. If you don't know, Cloudflare is a sort of edge computing thing that allows you to cache and distribute your uh, front ends, right? So it's very efficient and very well working for speeding up your front ends and caching responses and countering DDoS attacks. And there's like 2 billion different features there. Basically, they're pretty good at what they do. They also have free tiers. So if you like have open source products or stuff like this, I think you can just use it for free. Um, and there's maybe, maybe there's some limits. I never actually checked it out myself because I never needed to handle that many requests and, you know, to mitigate this whole process. But uh, before they was just doing like caching essentially, right? And now they allow you to offload your service worker onto their service, uh, which is first of all, really fast because they are kind of experts in this. And second of all, it's super cheap. It's 50 cents per million requests. It is insane. Like, and uh, service workers are not something you deploy every time, right? So most of the time you just download it once and then it just sits in cache and until you tell the app to refresh it. So I'm assuming this will be like dirty cheap. So basically $5 per month is probably what you will pay most of the time. So it's actually really cool to see something like this happen. Service worker is a service, I guess. And uh, yeah, there's definitely, if you know, if you, if you are dealing with this kind of problems, this thing is worth looking into. Right, continuing next, we got a new proposal for Node.js core. And there's like a pretty large discussion as you can see over here. So there's like a lot of comments here and there's ongoing discussion uh, for adding WebSockets supports to the Node.js core. So right now they are not in the core. So you have to use third party libraries that can be written purely in JavaScript or can rely on C libraries or Rust libraries. There's like 2 billion of variations, right? But it's if it gets added to the node core, that will be actually amazing. So I don't really have anything against the libraries, but uh, in my opinion, having it in the core, because this is kind of the crucial feature for the modern apps, right? Having it in the core would mean that you don't need to drag additional libraries from NPM, Yarn, whatever. And obviously that will speed up the stuff. And uh, it's if it's a C implementation, that will be even faster. So for example, there is, um, was it U WebSocket, I think, or well, I mistyped it. I think it's U WebSockets. Um, yeah, I think this is the library, right? Micro, it's like micro WebSockets, micro VS. It's a C library that is insanely fast. It is very, very, very efficient. And this is probably the fastest one you can find on the market and see. So basically putting that inside of Node.js would be quite easy. And as you can see here, it's, well, yeah, 
300 percent in comparison to j just like if you compare it to socket io is like 30 40 times faster i guess maybe even more it's like it's hard to say because there's like i guess 30 percent. so this is like thousand times better i guess it's kind of crazy so adding that to the core would be a welcome addition and uh, would be pretty cool to see but as i said this is an ongoing discussion so we're going to see how that ends up but you know http2 for example is already in node core and is uh even though it is different from web sockets i would say that this is a very similar um how do i put it conceptually right so this is this is the word i'm looking for so it's it's really interesting to see where it's gonna end up right continuing we got some uh smaller news so this is the thing that is shipped in chrome 66 which is i believe right now in beta branch so it's not yet released completely but uh so if you didn't know you could put a div or whatever any tag uh, you can add the content editable thing right so we can actually demonstrate it over here so we take this p right and i just add an attribute and i say content editable i will be able to just click it and then type here right so this is doable to any tag uh, the problem with it is that even though, well, no, 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 this is what I wanted to do. The problem with this is that even though you are able to edit the tag on mobile devices, you still will get the default keyboard, right? That is just your average keyboard. But sometimes you might want to have like a custom editable element with a custom keyboard, right? So they've added this input mode uh, attribute that is can be added on anything that is content editable. They will actually force the mobile device to switch into any keyboard you want. So it can be like phone, it can be email, it can be numeric, decimal, whatever, right? And this is a really cool proposal. So I'm, there's been too many mobile websites that, you know, show you a login form that looks really nice, but then you like enter your email and you're like, okay, you present it with normal keyboard and you have to search for ad symbol. And it's like a bit of a pain in the ass to, to put it plainly. So here's hoping this will fix it because this looks really promising. Continuing further. So there is a new work in progress RFC for uh, React that is called get snapshot before update. Um, it is not yet finalized. It's not yet even properly discussed as far as I understood. So there's a format RFC over here. We can have a look. The idea is that you can before, so there's, uh, we, we currently have two, uh, lifecycle methods in react right you have the component will update that is triggered before the update and you have component did update that is triggered after the update so get snapshot before update will be triggered before uh, component did update i think wait a second let me just read it through delays between render phase no it, it will be after will update but before did update and will have access but before the mutations are applied so basically you could do something like uh, preserve the scrolling position within the lists as the list content are updated, right? So the idea is that you get the uh, access to previous state and previous props. You can do something to them and return new value. And then you get this value within the component did update function, which you can use to do something like, for example, in this case, you know, the example says to uh, maintain the scroll height, right? Uh, which is... I see more than one use case. So one of them is obviously the scroll hate as well. There's some additional cool things that you could do with that. But uh, once again, this is not finalized. This work in progress. So we're going to see where this leads. Okay, continuing. Uh, not strictly JavaScript, but I thought it's uh, quite newsworthy. So this is uh, news from Let's Encrypt, guys. Um, ACME version 2 and wild, uh, wildcard certificate support is live. Um, unless you are doing something crazy, you are likely not going to need wildcard certificates, but if you need them, then that's great news and you can just get them, uh, the same rules, uh, for, as for the normal certificates apply, they only valid for, uh, what is it? 30, 60 days. So, you know, nothing really changed here aside from the fact that you can actually get wildcard certificates. I have yet actually to have a use case where I need that. So I have a traffic essentially set up on my server and uh, it just auto fetches certificates for any demos that I deploy in uh, my subdomains. So that works perfectly fine. I don't know why I would need the uh, wildcard ones, but um, you know, maybe you have the use case for that, then great news for you. 
Right, continuing. Uh, we'll get more tweets about more really cool proposals coming into React, uh, next versions of React, essentially. So this is the RFC for um, ref forwarding. So the idea is that uh, when you put a ref on the component, right, uh, if you put it on DOM node, it will be the ref to this button, right? But if you put it on custom component, it will be referring to whatever is the top element, which, which might not be what you want in some cases. So the idea is that you would have this React forward ref. Um, I think this is not the final syntax. I'm not sure like, you know, if it's finalized or not. Uh, the idea is that basically using the React forward ref, you could actually pass the specific ref that you want user to have or the or you want the component to refer to, right? So in this case, if you take the ref from this like button, it will actually refer to the button, not to the div that is styling essentially. Um, pretty useful. So I can see a lot of uh, use cases here that'd be very helpful, especially with the custom components. There is as usual from at RFC here. I think it is more or less complete here with all the drawbacks, alternatives and everything, um, non-resolved questions. So moving along quite nicely. Yeah. Very straightforward thing. Um, think will be helpful in quite a lot of cases. Don't think it's gonna, I mean, it's probably gonna land in 16.3 as it's written here. Don't think it's gonna be delayed. So really cool news. Uh, React keep getting better and better with that release. That's always great. Continuing, we got another thing in Chrome 66. It is a sync libert API, um, which means that uh, you can actually finally use it asynchronously, right? Before it used to, to work with like uh, callbacks, but now we have a sync away, so everything must be um, awaitable, which I mean, in my opinion, this is awesome because you know, I, I like a sync await code way more than callbacks, right? So that is nice that they've added that. Uh, minor improvement, obviously nothing too serious, but you know, yeah, thousand percent better than exact command copy. That's, that's a fair point. Okay, continuing. Um, making WebAssembly better for Rust and all languages. This is a pretty lengthy article that goes in depth on actually Rust mostly, right? So if you didn't know, you can uh, just take a Rust language right now and compile it to WebAssembly. It has the WebAssembly as one of the compile targets. So you don't even have to invent anything. You just like, literally say, hey, compile this through WebAssembly and you get a WebAssembly library on the exit that you can just load in JavaScript and use. The problem was that uh, you couldn't actually use JavaScript classes from Rust, right? So if you generate the library, it had to be standalone and you couldn't access anything uh, from the JavaScript world. Well, they fixed it using the Vasm bind gen. Um, I'm assuming this means bind generator, bindings generator, right? And the idea is that there's like pretty in-depth explanation here, but I'll just jump to the example here. The idea is that you can use uh, some, um, not sure how they call it in Rust, I guess like annotations, let's call them this way. If you know Rust and know how that's called, please do not let me know in the comments or in the chat right now. Um, but yeah, basically it allows you to use annotation to define the external module. So in this case, this is for example, console, and then you can bind a function and use that function in Rust, right? So you can just use console log, but that will invoke the uh, JavaScript function once you export it to WebAssembly, which is quite powerful. Um, I assume this means that this uh, console and whatever you bind it to should be accessible from the window scope, right? But that means that you can build some crazy stuff using that. So that is really, really cool. And you know, if you're writing WebAssembly, if you have a use case where WebAssembly is required and you need JavaScript interrupt, that is some really great news. Okay, continue. Another uh, quite of um, in-depth insights that you might not know or you might want to refresh, how JavaScript works, the rendering engine and tips to optimize its performance. So this is a, again, pretty lengthy post on the way that rendering engine works. So specifically rendering engine and the ways to basically optimize it so that it doesn't take too much time to do its work. Uh, very, very good to know, especially if you are performance freak, <laughs> that is always good, good stuff to know because uh, rendering is one of the most expensive things you could do with your code, unless you're doing something CPU intensive, right? I mean, paintings are usually pretty intensive and especially if you are using animations and stuff like this, 
So it's always good to know how exactly the engine works to optimize for it, right? So it's a pretty good article, do have a look at it. Uh, there's also some references to other related things, which could be good to read through. Um, continuing. Um, another V8 Chrome related news. So this is um, related to RA Flatten and Flatmap. They just landed in V8 behind the Harmony RA Flatten flag. So you can actually now run them and they work as expected as described in the proposal. I assume because they did not finish the whole discussion about this smoosh and uh, smoosh map and flat and flat map naming, they will change the names or they might change the names at some point, but the implementation is already there. I mean, it's kind of expected because it's a very straightforward thing to, to do, right? I mean, we had the implementation in Lodash for ages for that. So there's already like tons of jokes about that, which are also great. Like this, I, lo I love this one, that's really great. So yeah, continuing. All right, we got a slightly clickbaity title for this one, but it's actually a relatively good article. It's called, you can build a neural network in JavaScript even if you don't understand neural networks. Um, and I would go slightly more to specify this um, a bit more because what this article describes is building a classifier based on a neural network. So this, this article guides you through building a classifier that will, when you can throw in a tweet and it will tell you uh, whose tweet is that? Uh, is it from Donald Trump or Kim Kardashian? So it's a pretty straightforward classification. You just create a BrainJS uh, neural network. Then you throw in a bunch of tweets from Trump saying that this is tweets from Trump. And then you throw in a bunch of tweets from Kim Kardashian saying this is tweets from Kim Kardashian. You train the model and then at some point you can execute the tweet and see, you know, what's kind of, uh, who, who did that, right? So nothing really complicated here, but a pretty good start if you never did anything like this. Uh, once probably explain all the in-depth uh, works of the neural networks and stuff like this, but uh, you know, you will build their first classifier, so it's pretty neat. Right, continuing. Oh yeah, this one is, well, I mean, it's kind of news, but not exactly. So Firefox Quantum Extension, um, let me try that again. Firefox Quantum Extensions Challenge announced, right? There is now a challenge for everyone to build an extension for Firefox Quantum. It will go until April 15 and you can win some stuff if you do that. Since we did the extension uh, on Wednesday on the developer stream, I thought it would be a good idea to tell about that. And you know, if you're guys interested in, to, in participating, then just go ahead and uh, create it. There are some rules here and then some categories that you can do stuff in. So, you know, if, you, if that sounds like something you would do, you still have basically a month to go. So go ahead and uh, apply with your extensions and let me know. I would love to see those by the way. So send them over my way as well. Right, uh, next thing that is not exactly in use as well is a TT39 developer engagement survey. Um, so the guys at TC39 trying to uh, make how we work more transparent and want your feedback essentially. So if you are interested in that, if you're interested in knowing what stuff uh, do they do and how to help them, if you basically wanna help them be more transparent and deliver more interesting stuff to you, please do fill it out, it is very short. Will take like five minutes to fill out. Um, very helpful for TC39, obviously. So if you want to help uh, present the stuff they do better, then please do answer that. That's basically all I have to say here. So let's continue. Now we are into the releases section. So there is quite a bunch this time around. So we got the first of all new Firefox version. Uh, this is the version 59. There is mostly stuff like performance improvements and uh, some Firefox screenshot stuff and better web uh, extensions API. I don't think there's any major things added. So there's like mostly like, yeah, kind of, it is a major release, but most of it is just like, you know, incremental improvements and new things that are kind of nice to have and just make it work better. So still, if you're using Firefox, uh, Good for you, you know. Right, this one is pretty large actually. So REPL it is uh, releasing uh, version 1.0. This is uh, one more online IDE, but um, instead of allowing you to run just the React code, for example, it allows you to run full stack apps, right? And uh, 
it's not only JavaScript, so you can run Node.js apps, but you can also do Python, you can do Golang, you can do just about anything. So if you can click on REPL here, I think I do have an account here. Hell, if I remember if I was GitHub or something, there we go. So there's actually React Native, Go, Python, and uh, whatever the hell you want. So you can search, there's like top, um, yeah, as you can see, the list is very large and essentially you can write uh, full stack apps right in here, right? So I've tried, uh, I usually use it to try and run some tests um, on basically packages that interest me. <laughs> when I'm too lazy to write, you know, switch to my development notebook, for example, I just uh, run it in browser. So it's a pretty cool one and definitely worth having a look at. Uh, right. Continuing, we got a Billboard JS130. So if you are not familiar with Billboard, it's an abstraction over D3JS um, for simpler creation of charts. So if you don't need any fancy D3JS features, or if you just want to build some charts, uh, Billboard is actually one of the simplest ones to use. So you just, you know, throw in the data and get a nice pie chart or line chart or whatever is the basic like bar charts uh, out as a D3JS render, right? Very easy to use and as a new version with uh, mostly like small improvements, but still, you know, maybe you didn't hear about this library. It's pretty good. Um, yeah, it has quite a lot of different uh, chart types. So you don't have to write this yourself. I mean, once again, it, it's, it only works for quite simple use cases. So if you need something very complex in D3JS, then you are better off using D3JS itself. I mean, it's not that complicated, but if you want to throw in something together really quick and it's something simple, then this library works pretty well. Continuing, there is a React Select version two. This is a preview though. Um, so this is a really cool uh, selection component for React. Um, I think I have the JavaScript blocked over here. Let me do this. There we go. Okay. If you haven't used it, it's a very nice looking and very easy to use select component that supports like multi-select and all that stuff, including like animations and, you know, a bunch of different other styling things. And uh, basically there's version two coming out soon and uh, Jed Watson will be presenting that on New York React. I think he already did at this point. So uh, yeah, it's coming out pretty soon. And this is, I think this is my go-to select component especially when I need the multi-select ones. Um, pretty cool one, so have a look at it. Continuing, we got the new version of NPM. Uh, it's a pre-release and this time around they actually tagged it as once <laughs> to stop confusing people, thank God, so that nobody l runs it in the production anymore and screws everything up. Um, so the major thing here is that they try to um, sort of preserve the styling of your package block and shrink wrap as well as update the some dependencies no color standard updates and there's some other minor things that are not as interesting uh, one of the biggest ones is the npm ci update that is once more increased in speed which is great um, if they keep doing it uh, in this way i might go back from yarn to npm Although, you know, I, I don't know, I haven't actually tried NPM CI yet. Not sure how that will compare to Yarn because Yarn is still blazing fast. And I'm not sure if I go back ever. <laughs> All right, continuing. We got Atom125, new release. Seems to be focused mostly on the GitHub package as well as some Python and HTML language improvements. And as always, there's some more performance and responsiveness. I think this is like pretty much in every Atom update, which is great. Don't get me wrong. Uh, and there's, yeah, as well as like syntax highlighting, confolding. It seems to fix this silly bug. I think that's been there for ages, actually. So if you have this like kind of like line break, the folding would fold that kind of like this, which is, yeah, not exactly what you want, right? So, so they fixed it, which is nice. Um, updated Electron as well. So there's like 1.7.11 now. Uh, Beta for the next version is already out, seems to be also focused on the GitHub package again. So they seem to be pushing a lot for the GitHub integration, which kind of makes sense because it's a GitHub editor. All right, continuing, we got the new RC for TypeScript. Uh, so it's TypeScript 2.8 with uh, major features being conditional types, which is pretty interesting. So the idea is that you can check if the class extends something 
and then assign a type to um, or create a type depending on that. I personally don't use TypeScript that much, right? So I don't really can't really say when that will be useful. But if you use, you probably in, in your, if you use the TypeScript and you see that, you probably already know the use cases where you would apply that. I imagine that is a pretty useful thing. Um, I think this is like the major highlight of release. The other one is the other the JSX pragmas finally, so you can actually write your own. If you are not familiar with those, um, they are actually, so when you write JSX, the parser will actually transform it into function calls, right? And the pragma allows you to define the function to be called. So in this case, we import the DOM from renderer and then this DOM should be used as a render function. So here's, we, here's what it compiles to. So we get the renderer and then we use a renderer DOM with the parameter H and null for any children because it's just one tag, right? There is also granular control and map type modifiers. I have no idea how to use that neither. Um, you know, it's like, I just don't have enough experience with TypeScript to actually tell you about it. I'm just gonna skip over that. And uh, that's basically it for the TypeScript. Right, the last, I think this is the last thing we have. Let me, yes, this is the last thing we have for the releases. This is MobX version four. Um, if you used it, you probably know uh, what it is and how to use it. So they seem to have added uh, decorators that is usable without decorator syntax because the decorator syntax is still work in progress. And I think this proposal has been in, in there for ages, still not finalized. Uh, they allow you to dynamically extend observable objects now and you can now await stuff, um, I think, yeah, okay, smaller, faster, that is like, every release ever but i think the major one is basically this allowing to use decorators without decorator syntax i guess it's just gonna be function calls right yeah so they just converting it so before you um you was bound to use the decorator syntax which is again something that is still not finalized is only available through babel but now you can just use function calls then you don't need babel for example right if you are writing for modern browsers which is unlikely but still nice to have and uh yeah it's a nice addition okay uh we are done with the releases now i want to go through some neat libraries and uh, projects and demos that i found over the duration of the week the first one we have is the um, demo from brian holtz it's about making voice assistance in javascript it's a code pen demo it is very straightforward so uh, we are not interested in styling here it uses the speech recognition API and uh, it is actually very easy to make a calculator using that. So yeah, just have a look at the source code. It's like literally like, you know, 130 lines, 134 lines to make a voice powered calculator. Kind of crazy when you think about it. So go ahead and build your own voice assistant. All right. Um, Next thing is the EV by Undraw. So I mentioned the Undraw during my last stream. It's a pretty cool website that gives you MIT licensed SVG illustrations. So if you need any images, you might've seen that on my splash screen, by the way. Oh, that's a new one. I probably need to put that on my splash screen. That looks nice. Uh, so they've introduced the framework uh, for the UI. So essentially like Bootstrap or Bulma similar, right? So it's much simpler. But uh, this is what they use to develop their site, right? So it also has like pages, page templates, uh, components, elements, whatever you can imagine, all that is here, nice color schema. And you know, if you are into this kind of stuff, have a look at it. Um, seems to be quite minimal, but you know, maybe that's exactly what you are looking for. Right, continuing, we got a small library called Money Clip. Uh, this is a library for managing your client-side cache. It's a small wrapper around the IndexedDB that just adds versioning and max age. And this is exactly what you want for cache. Very, seems to be very easy to use basically. Um, nothing exactly complicated here. Does have additional thing. Uh, it has the Redux um, adapter, I guess you would call it, a Redux middleware. This is how you call it, right? <laughs> haven't used middlewares in ages. So it has a Redux persist middleware that basically lazily caches the content of the reducers. 
So this is also interesting and it's uh, pretty tiny. So it doesn't add too much overhead to your project. So nice library. Continuing, we got the Moise uh, or Moise. I'm not sure how to read that correctly, but this is a memoization solution for JavaScript. If you are not familiar with memoization, um, apology with my, my bad. Let me try that again. If you are not familiar with memoization uh, term, the idea is that you can memoize a function and uh, once you call, so if your function returns deterministic result based on the parameters, you can basically save that result and next time the function is called with the same parameters, you just return it from cache, right? So this is the whole idea of memoization. There's a bunch of libraries doing that and this is just one of them. Uh, seems to be pretty um, flexible. So there's a lot of parameters as you can see here and uh, also seems to be pretty small in, in sort of size, right? So if you are looking to improve your performance, there's definitely a library to have a look at. Right, next one is a bit more fun. It's called Rough.js. It's a sort of hand-drawn, sketchy appearance graphics creation based on Canvas and uh, SVG pass. It's all, or rather it can be drawn both to Canvas and to SVG looks something like this. You can also draw like text and stuff. There's, yeah, there's an example with the map. Uh, very easy to use. So there is uh, docs on the GitHub. Pretty well documented. I mean, yeah, okay, there's, there was examples in the, there as well, so I should have looked better. But yeah, so, you know, this is the example with Canvas. I think they had an example with SVG somewhere there. Yeah, there you go, this is the SVG example. So you can actually also render SVG pass here. Pretty nicely looking. So if you're looking to add some um, roughly looking graphics to your website, that's probably the way to go. And MIT licensed, always great. Right, continuing, we got Immer. Um, this is, uh, as I don't remember, someone on Twitter, someone from the React guy said like, okay, so why wasn't this created earlier? Because this library makes a lot of sense. The idea is that you can create a next immutable state by mutating the current one, right? So. Typically in React, you um, create a new object and then you add the new values to it, right? And then you return the new object because you, you can't mutate the old one, right? So this is one of the Redux, or not in React, in Redux. It's one of the rules of the Redux. So what Immer does, it actually allows you to mutate, take the current state, then mutate it, and then it will produce the resulting state from that mutation. The API is also very straightforward. So you have this uh, produce function that takes the base state and then it takes a function that will have the draft state that you can modify whatever you want. So you can like, you know, push to it, change it, whatever. And once the function executes, it will produce the next state as a result of this produce function, right? So it will not modify the base state. It will give you the new object. Very straightforward, very cool. Um, you probably can already see the, um, use of it. So there's the use for reducers exactly with that produce function. So you basically return instead of doing this stuff, which I mean, it's admittedly, it's not too bad, right? But then again, if you need to do something like this, if it's like, you know, nested arrays or something, then it gets ugly, you need to do all this like reduce map, whatever, find specific object, um, way easier to do just one for each and modify it. So instead of doing all the assignments, you just return the produce function and just modify the state, which is great. I'm actually, by the way, not sure why I have not started. So let me do that right now, because this is a great addition for Redux. So if you're using Redux, then it can simplify your code quite a bit. Definitely look at that. Uh, sports carring as well, which is great, by the way. So yeah, since you can, uh, Wait a second, does it carry the other way around too? Produce draft in, the, yeah, it looks like you can carry it the other way around too. Okay, that's pretty cool. So it's uh, integrated carrying capabilities. Basically, if you give the function first, it will also take in the base second, right? Yeah, okay, that's pretty nice. Okay, so very well thought through library. So do have a look at that. Next thing we have is a mark text. This is a full flesh markdown editor based on Electron.js. Um, I guess if you are a developer, you're probably don't really need that because you're writing in VS Code or something, right? At least that's, that's how I do it. Um, I usually have like VS Code and just open two panes and do that. 
but you know maybe you want to write an article and focus on it this one has quite a lot of uh, nice features like you know markdown selection auto completes for stuff uh, code fans with like code highlighting and everything different themes um, so on and so forth and you can even like source code mode to edit the source code directly some nice things here basically and it's open source so you know if you're not interested in using it but having a look at how it's built you can just go onto github and have a look at the source code definitely worth a look pretty good one okay going uh continuing here uh, the next one is dom to image does exactly what you would expect it takes a dom node and uses canvas to render it to image very straightforward to use you just say you know dom image to png whatever the node that you get from the dom right and uh, then you can either create the uh, image and append it right away to the document you're using or you can download it or whatever right so save as as a blob there's a lot of usage for that and um I it's it's always great to have a simple abstraction to do that. I mean, it's not exactly hard task to do, right? But doing it manually with Canvas yourself is kind of pain in the ass. So it's nice that there is a better abstraction for it. Basically, um, I should start it probably too. All right, continuing Discord JS. So time to chill. Uh, if you don't know, we have a Discord chat. Uh, it should be in the description of the Twitch channel as well as the YouTube video if you're watching it on YouTube. And we chat there about news and about development. And I can help you there if you have any JavaScript questions and also help you find correct libraries and stuff like this. So please join us. Um, library here is uh, basically a Discord API wrapper that allows you to build bots for it, right? Among other things. So if you are looking into uh, have your own Discord server or want to build a bot that would do something for you, then uh, this one is pretty easy to use and uh, can be used for, well, basically anything you can imagine using Discord API. So quite a good one. Right, continuing, we got a wonder bar, a simple horizontal bar chart for terminals, which look very fancy. So if you are writing command line tools and need some progress bars or display a bar chart or something, yeah, horizontal bar charts, obviously, this is definitely the one to look at. You can also give in the data like this. I don't know why you would need that, but uh, hey, maybe you just want to visualize something from the file. So yeah, there you go. There's an example with a JSON file. So you can do that as well. Pretty cool. Continuing, we got Emma Klee. Uh, it's a terminal assistant for finding and installing node packages. Might be useful if you don't really know what you want to install yet or don't remember the exact name of the package. You just type Emma, future BXJS project. Uh, what do you mean? Which one? Um, yeah, so you can just start Emma and then start typing the package name and it will just search package and show you the available options. And you know, you can hit enter and it will install it for you. Discord JS. Oh yeah, we can, uh, I think we had a proposal for building a bot somewhere in the, uh, I don't remember if it's in a GitHub actually, but we can do a bot. Sure, that sounds like fun. Okay, continuing with the tools, we got driver.js. Uh, this is what you would call a demo framework, right? So it's easier to just show you what it does. So essentially the idea is that you can just click a button and then, you know, you get this, uh, okay, start. You get the, you know, kind of walk through through the page with all the tooltips and animations and everything. So. And it's pretty small, pretty lightweight, and pretty easy to use. Uh, if you're looking for a thing like this, it's uh, CSS and JS together, obviously. Very easy to use, uh, works on DOM itself, so you would have to point it towards the elements, so it might be a bit tricky to use it with uh, React.js, but still quite straightforward API, and you know, if you need this kind of thing, uh, might be one of the best ones, actually. Right, continuing, we got a Pell, uh, simple and smallest, as they say, what you see is what you get text editor for the web with no dependencies. It is very small. Yes, indeed. So very simple, uh, has all the kind of things that you would imagine. I wonder what kind of formats does it export because I have not checked that. I am assuming HTML, right? Yes, it does export HTML. It would be nice to have sort of uh, markdown as output, for example, then I would be able to use it in uh, more projects because I think Saving HTML is maybe not the best way, but uh, hey, whatever. 
If you're looking for tiny vortices where you get text editor, this might be your choice. Um, seems, well, I mean, under one kilobyte, that's insane. Okay, um, that's basically it for the demos. So there is one repository I wanna talk about uh, before we wrap the whole thing up. This is an awesome developer streams. Um, you might've seen it already. So somebody basically decided to gather all the devs who do live streams and videos and whatever. And there is a pretty extensive list over here with uh, all the technologies, times, links, whatever you can imagine. So if you are interested in, in seeing more people talk about development, do development, live stream development, go ahead and have a look. Maybe you'll find some more interesting people. Again, links on everything to each Patreon website, GitHub, whatever you can imagine is all here. So yes, a bunch of cool people. And there was also um, a website made from this. Wait a second. I think it was something like DevStream Tor or something. Um, let me try to find it. So we got DevStream 2, was it? Uh, no, no, that's not. Okay, I'll try to find it later, but there was, someone made a website from that uh, live stream. There's probably some people watching me from there right now because I'm also on that list. So if you know the link, please put it into the chat. That would be really helpful. All right, uh, so yeah, you basically can find more cool people to watch there. Um, this is a very silly thing. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm like Twitter video quality is complete garbage, but this bit is, I retweeted that. This is the silliest thing I've ever seen. It is anime about HTML and JavaScript programming. I have no idea what's going on in the anime itself, but this, this looks just, it is ridiculous. It is also, the link is in the um, current list. So if you're interested, you can go ahead and have a look. And uh, yes, famous HTML, exactly. And uh, be amazed to the, the discussion behind that stuff. All right, uh, so this it this is it from my side. Um, this is all I have for this week. So if you have anything else you wanna discuss, throw it in my way. Uh, if not, then, uh, well, that's basically it. If you find any cool links during the next week, feel free to send it my way on Twitter, Discord, uh, wherever you find me. I mean, on GitHub, open the issue in the BXGS weekly uh, repository, that also works fine. Always happy to see new cool links because I am sure that I might've missed some really cool news that, you know, I'm just like, I'm one person, I cannot find everything, but I try my best to do the, you know, the best and the most interesting ones. So yes, um, I, Yes, we are done here for today. This was BXGS Weekly episode number two. I hope you enjoyed it. Looking forward to doing this next week. Thank you for watching. And uh, I guess I see you next time. Bye.